Well, good morning. I think we're uh, about a few seconds late this morning, so uh, uh, let's begin this morning with a song, and we may sing them in to us. When the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall arise, and the splendors immortal shall envelop the skies, when the, mor uh, when the angel of death shall no longer destroy and the dead shall awaken in the morning of joy in the morning of joy in the morning of joy we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy in the morning of joy in the morning of joy we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy well, we're singing about the last day, but every morning ought to be a morning of joy. We don't need to wait for the resurrection in order to have joy in the Christian life, do we? So this morning, I want to start thinking about it with you. Um, I have a, a warm-up question for you. What's the strangest thing you've ever seen? You just couldn't have expected to see that happen. But it happened and you saw it. You ever... Pardon me? A cat riding a bicycle. Was there another bicycle rider with it? No, it was a bicycle. All by its... Now that is unusual. That sounds like a circus act or something almost. They have whole shows made for these crazy videos, don't they? Um, yes. Uh, you, you've actually seen a duck-billed platypus. That is an unusual animal. I hear it even lays eggs. It's the mammal that lays eggs. It's a very unusual creature. Yeah. If you see one of those, they're unusual. Um, I was sitting in my big comfy brown chair yesterday and, th and then there was all these giggles that started happening next to me and they got louder and louder and louder and evidently some guy, it just seemed stupid to me, but some guy showed up at a Kentucky Fried Chicken in a chicken suit <laughs> and was walking around and clucking at everyone. Did you see it too? And Glenda was just laughing and I thought, that's the stupidest thing. I, that's not strange, that's stupid. And it went beyond strange for me. Some things are highly unusual. But one thing that was very highly unusual is to read the book of Philippians and find the joy that's there written by a man who is in chains. An individual who is under guard every day and yet, while he is awaiting a trial before Caesar, he writes this book that is so completely full of joy. Uh, th this morning, what we're going to do is go from passage to passage, and let's notice how many times the book of Philippians talks about joy. Now, Gloria and I have been having our debate about that, what, did I pop off with saying it was 13 or 14 times? And she let me know, no, it is this number. And I have to say we were both wrong. Whenever I went back through the book and counted once again, I had missed one or two. And sure enough, she'd missed one or two as well. So let's go through the book of Philippians and notice how many times the idea of charis, not, but of joy is found here in the book of Philippians, both in the, the command, uh, rejoice in the Lord, at verb form, but also in the noun form of rejoicing. First, go to chapter 1, and in his greeting, Paul gives thanks for them. Verse 3, I thank God upon every remembrance, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. He's got happy prayers. He has joyful prayers. He is uh, 
He is thanking God for their fellowship in the gospel from the very beginning and now confident that they're going to continue. Paul had every reason to be joyful for the Philippians. Remember, we only know, we hear of two households being converted to Christ in the city of Philippi. But in between, there was plenty of preaching going on. Uh, who are the two people? Who is the lady who was down by the riverside in Philippi? Lydia, the, the woman from, not, from out of town, the Thyatiran woman, but also who had her household there in the city. And she not only believed, but she insisted that they come into her house, and she and her whole household believed. And so uh, that was the beginning of the church was Lydia. And then they're going around preaching and they cast out a demon from, this wo- from a, a woman, a, a spirit of divination. And she stops her, her uh, profit making activities and they have them arrested. So who's our second convert we know of in the city of Philippi? The jailer, the Philippian jailer. So, um, we start with happy prayers, remembering them, and then notice verse 18. Paul begins talking about Christ being preached, but some are preaching Christ in order to cause him problems. And what's Paul's response in verse 18? In every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So incidences number two and three are things that make me angry. It frustrates me whenever somebody wants to cause me trouble. How about you? you, Don't you run into those people who are frustrating and upsetting you? But Paul is able to see these individuals, while they are causing Paul problems, are not preaching lies. They're preaching the truth. They're just going out and being more active in, uh, in order to cause Paul problems. Well, as long as Christ is being preached, Paul's happy about that. And so he not only is rejoicing, but he's going to continue rejoicing and he's not going to let them get him down. That sounds like to me like a decision. How about you? You've got to make a choice in order to rejoice in the middle of problems because you see the positive aspects of the problem. Reminds me of James chapter 1 whenever James says not to rejoice in trials but to count it all brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing the proving your faith works patience. Trials aren't joy, but they're to be counted as joy. We're not talking about counting joy. He's saying, I'm going to rejoice. And I will rejoice. This is my determination in the future. There's number two and three. Number four is in, in, uh, still in chapter one. In verse 25, while he has been saying, I'm in a straight betwixt the two. I don't know whether it's to stay or whether to depart and be with the Lord, which is far better. But to stay is more needful for your sake. And in verse 25, being confident of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith. It's for their joy, their rejoicing. So technically, Paul's not saying, I'm rejoicing, but he's saying, I'm here for your joy. So the book is still filled with joy there in verse 4. And I I wouldn't be very happy. Well, I understand Paul's longing for this next world. We're still, for the fifth incident, incident, we're still in this very same passage. And that for verse 26... And that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Christ, in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. It would be, it would, there would be even more joy if I'm able to come back to you. And there is, every, there is a possibility that Paul got back to Philipp, Philippi at some point. Um, there seem, there may be, there's a whole different attitude here in the book of Philippians 
between the book of Philippians and the book of 2 Timothy. While Paul describes his trials and imprisonment in 2 Timothy, he at that point is saying, I fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, I'm being poured out as an offering. He uh, talks about the crown that's left over for him. He does, not, he does not expect to die immediately, but he doesn't expect to be released from that imprisonment. This one, he seems to have every hope and expectation to be re released, and there is uh, historical possibilities that he was. Yes, sir. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant by, in Christ Jesus. I did check the Greek on this. It's the same term. I, 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 Gloria, you made me check the Greek on every one of these terms. And everyone has a form of the same term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do I have, yeah, rejoicing for me may be more abundant. I'm not sure we're con confidence. Verse 25 is I'm confident of this for your progress and joy of the faith. It's at the end of the verse where the word joy is found. Joy of faith. Confidence is also mine in verse 25. But in verse 25, the end of the verse talks about their joy in the faith. And then verse 26, he talks about their rejoicing over him coming. So, uh, not, that, not that we're going to get an earth-shattering uh, make an earth-shattering difference for us about how many, exactly how many times the word rejoicing comes up. But number six, let's go on to chapter two. Therefore, there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of love, fulfill my, verse two, joy. Make full my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind, and let this attitude be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. So our joy can be more or less full depending upon how those we are encouraging and helping are actually being faithful or not. So make my joy full by being, by being humble, Paul says in verse 2. Verse 16, Paul talks about them obeying and in verse 16, he says in verse 15, that you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of faith, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have run, run it, not run in vain or labored in vain. Verse 16, if there, we are faithful to the end, then Paul expects to rejoice. This is analogous to uh, 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, where we're reminded to be take. Heed how we build on God's temple, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones, because our work will be tested by fire. And he's there really talking to the preachers and to the evangelists who are bringing people to Christ. Are you doing this for your own purposes? Are you trying to make money at this? It seems to be a problem in Corinth. Are you really building on the church of God as Apollos and I have done? Because your work will be tested by fire. Now, um, Paul's real joy is going to come when he sees their faithfulness in the day of judgment. Now, when we get down to verse 17, continue reading. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad, the word rejoicing is there in glad, and rejoice with you all. So we have the term joy and rejoice to be offered on the sacrifice and service of your faith. Joy and rejoice. I'm glad and rejoice, or your translation may say joy and rejoice. There's where I ended up with an extra one, Gloria, because my new King James only said um, I am glad and rejoice. But it is a, a form of the same term. Continuing our reading, we'll just go to the very next verse. Verse 18. For the same reason, 
you also be glad and rejoice with me. That's actually two, two, uh, it, two t- times the same term is coming up. <clears throat> we have every reason to rejoice as long as we are faithful. <clears throat> and even if Paul is going to lose his life in Rome and is poured out as a drink offering, rejoice with me. I'm going to joy and rejoice, and you joy and rejoice with me that I've been able to, su- to serve Christ. Yes. There is an attitude of gratitude in that word. Absolutely. We've got to be thankful in order to have joy. And we've got to see things from God's perspective. Our perspective is, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And Paul's perspective is, I get to be poured out as a drink offering over your faith. It's kind of the picture of going to the temple, taking your sacrifice, and you've brought your lamb or your ox, uh, maybe just a turtle love, but then it, to top that sacrifice off, here's a drink offering being poured out. Now, you might get to have a, a bite of steak whenever you've offered a cow as a thank offering. If you offer a bird offering for your sins, it's gone. The whole thing is consumed. Nobody gets any of that. But if it's a thank offering, if it's a peace offering, then the fat gets burned to God, but and a portion all and a portion will be burnt on the altar, but a portion will come back to you. But boy, that drink offering, once you pour that drink out offering out on the altar, it's gone. And Paul said, I'll I'll be glad to be poured out over your sacrifice of faith. And rejoice with me if I am. Still in verse in chapter 2, for this same reason, in verse 28, excuse me, whenever they're talking about Epaphroditus, you ever been in trouble because you were sick? Anybody gotten mad at you because maybe you were hugging too many people at church and you came home sick? Or you didn't, you went out, I got in trouble without wearing my hat in Colorado when I was a boy and I'd run out without my hat and play and come back cold and mom would say, oh, you're going to get sick and it'll be all your fault. Well, Epaphroditus got sick and of course it cost money to send Epaphroditus to bring their offering to Paul. And Paul is telling him, don't, don't blame Epaphroditus. He was sick. He was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him. And so when you see him, verse 28, then rejoice that I may be less sorrowful. So there should be rejoicing at the recovery of Epaphroditus. And in fact, verse 28, um, you rejoice. And then verse 29, they're told to receive him with all gladness because he risked his life for you. How do we receive people sometimes? Especially when they've cost us money. Be grateful. He, he came back to you. Keep the right attitude. Keep looking for the right things. So much of what we'll be talking about is going to be making the right choices. Deciding to rejoice. And seeing things from God's perspective, not just our own perspective. Because we are so terribly selfish. The 14th is in chapter 3, verse 1. Where Paul says, finally, even though he's only halfway through with the book, he's starting the, 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 the third chapter. There'll be four chapters. He's exactly halfway, so it's time for him to say, in conclusion, he does not mean that it's the last thing he's going to say. He is saying of utmost and paramount importance is... Rejoice. Finally, the last thing you got to remember. Have you ever heard a, a lesson or, or heard a speech where somebody said, if you forget everything else I say, get this one. Well, that's, that's the big point of this book. Finally, of absolute utmost importance, as he's about to launch into the worst part of this book, at least as far as the most discouraging 
and depressing part of this book, having to talk about the false teaching and the false teachers that are going on. Well, he's going to say before he starts that discussion, he's going to say, finally, the most important thing is rejoice. Where do we put rejoicing in our scale of important things to do? I don't think I put that in my schedule all week. Well, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do something else, we've got to figure out this, and there's going to have to be shopping for that. Uh, yesterday I repaired a gate that had to be done or the dog's going to get out, but I didn't put, I didn't put rejoicing on my schedule anywhere. I, got, I kind of rejoiced that I got away with fixing the gate for $5, but instead of replacing it for, for 100 so that was great, but... If the most important thing is to rejoice, are we, putting, are we giving it the right priority? Finally, rejoice. Number 15. In verse 3, where Paul has just told us in verse 2, beware of the dogs. It says, for we are, the, they're the false circumcision, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. In between rejoicing in, in worshiping in the spirit and having no confidence in the flesh, Paul says, one of the things that makes us who we are is we rejoice in Christ. We're not worried about being Jewish. We don't rejoice in our circumcision. We rejoice in Jesus Christ. If you're in the spirit, you've got to be rejoicing. That's got to be our attitude. And if we are living a miserable life, having miserable things happen to us is one thing, but having a miserable reaction to all those things means we're not being influenced and carried along by God's spirit. Somebody else is in control. Because guess what? Sometimes we're not as in control as we think we are. We are whoever servant that we give ourselves to, according to Romans chapter 6. We're either going to be Satan's servant or God's. And we want to give ourselves to the devil. He's more than willing to, to influence us. Yes. Sure. If the Spirit is bearing that fruit in us, joy, it, it just comes. We don't have to change. Love, similar. I don't have to say, oh, okay, I need to stop and spend the next five minutes loving. It, it's just all day. It, it's in our DNA. All the fruit of the Spirit should be just who we are and flows. Now, having said that, It should. Now remember, we're on. We're we're doing. We're sending this out on the camera, so I need to get back what you were just saying. And I, I agree with you. On the one hand, you're saying, what uh, to make this a priority and say we got to set that on our schedule. It ought to flow naturally from the fruit of the spirit. It is love. It's number two, joy, peace, long suffering. It's got to come naturally. But on the other hand, as you were just saying, you have trouble with that. And so do we all. And that's why not only is he saying here, rejoice, make the choice to rejoice. Which is an unintentional pun, but anyway, uh, rhyme. But we need to. We've got to make that choice to rejoice. And every one of us, love is also a choice. Long-suffering is certainly a choice. Now, the more God's Spirit is acting in me and I am following His Word, and I'm also living the life, reading, I am praying, and God is in control of my life, these things are going to flow naturally. But guess what? 
They don't come naturally to a human being in the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, and they are, right? And they're hatred, and they are not rejoicing. They are outbursts of anger and wrath and enmity and jealousies, right? So, yep, if we're under God's control, we're all good. If we love, we're going to do the whole law, right? But we've got to decide to love. And this book still has to be written and read. And we still need to get in the habits of doing what God's Spirit tells us to do in order for it to have its influence for us. And guess what? God's going to help. It's going to move along. But if we want to go the other direction, God's not going to stop us, right? And so, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's something we've all got to deal with and, and work with. But, uh, and so we can go to the extreme of saying God's spirit has nothing to do with me. It's my job to do these things. And that's not biblical either, right? But to say it's all going to flow completely naturally, well, why did he write about it? Why did he have to tell me this? He does have to tell me this because I've got to give in. And here are, and we're going to be looking at some things that are clearly stated as to what we have to do. Um, but in chapter 3, verse 3, the final thing, the most important thing, here is the theme of my book. If you haven't gotten it yet, here it is. Rejoice in the Lord. Number 16. We're not going to have a lot of joy in chapter 4. If you, in chapter 3, if you find the word joy and rejoicing... That's not what Paul's talking about. He has to take a moment to brag with the Judaizers to be able to say, if you want to brag about the flesh, I can do that even more. But that's not something he's rejoicing over. He's not going to rejoice over the dogs, over the concision. He's not, but he's going to press on toward the goal. He's dealing with these issues, but we're going to get right back to it in chapter 4. Even as he got, he has one more problem to deal with, and that's going to be a very specific problem between two sisters in Christ in the church in Philippi. He wants to, as he tackles this last problem and then sums up the book, he's going to tell us, we are his joy. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And then, of course, we're going to get to chapter 4 and verse 4, and we're going to get it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. These are commands. They, are, they, they broach no other options. We do not get to choose whether or not to rejoice. If you missed it the first time, he'll say it twice. So number 17 and number 18, we are commanded to rejoice, and then we're going to hear all about how to do it. The, the 19th on my list is in chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care but lacked opportunity. He's talking about the gift that Epaphroditus brought. This is a thank you letter given by a missionary saying thank you for provi helping provide my needs as I am here in prison. In fact, while I'm so happy here in prison, right? He writes this book of joy and rejoicing, but that the heart of what we're going to be discussing is going to begin in chapter 4, verse 4. And carry us on through to verse 12. Oh, excuse me. Really to verse 9 is where we're going to be finding a whole course of studies worth of things to talk about. How am I supposed to rejoice? If you've given me the command to rejoice, where have you found this secret? How am I supposed to do this? You're rejoicing and yet, you're chained to a Roman guard. You are going to go on trial. You've been beaten. 
You've been shipwrecked. You have had false brethren who are even now trying to preach in order to cause you trouble. You've been left behind. You've had Mark forsake you. Glad he came home. Demas is going to forsake you. How are you supposed to rejoice, Paul? And yet Paul's saying, I rejoice over and over and over and over again. Have you met people who are rejoicers? They just, are their lives better than yours? I don't find ultra rich people as having any more joy than anybody else. I don't see them turning cartwheels in the street and being happy. And yet quite often, those who are not particularly well off have a sunny and happy disposition. What is it that causes us to smile and be happy? We have Christ. We have Christ. Did anybody else have a parent who taught them how to be happy? My mother taught me by by um, example. And it wasn't always the, she wasn't always happy. In fact, I think we, we, my sisters and I were sitting down and we were saying, you know, there was a cycle to mom. There was, we, we got kind of crazy mom. And we, and they were figuring out, the girls were figuring out this was on a hormonal cycle. That mom would kind of lose it. On about every 28 days, something bad was going to, she was going to have a hard time. Sometimes she'd be all right, but we almost always messed up. And so, and yet the woman, even though she had that trouble, uh, was filled with joy no matter what. And it had nothing to do with her upbringing. Um, Have you have relatives like that? That have had a very hard life, but they've they've come through it with a smile. I didn't. I could not have imagined one of the most, uh, one of the happiest elders of the church in of a church in Denver, Colorado. I did not realize had been one of the wealthiest businessmen in Denver, and had had to file bankruptcy. That no, through no fault of his own, the business he was in was, took a great deal of investment, and he was driven out of business, partly by the EPA, and partly by other businesses. It just became really unprofitable to do what he did. He was in the chroming business, re-chroming and, and plating things, and there are still businesses who do that, but it's very expensive and very difficult. But it used to be cheaper to have your bumper re-chromed than to buy a new bumper. And he was one of those who did that. And whenever he was driven out of business, he was deeply in debt. And yet, he, uh, once again, uh, he used his skills as a salesman in order to regain and recoup that fortune just to pay off his debts. And he lived the rest of his life much more frugally, but he dedicated himself to personal evangelism. He said, if I can sell, and I can pay off all these debts, and I can convince people to buy products, I surely can convince people to obey the gospel. And he did. He was a very effective personal worker, and he was filled with joy. But I had no idea he'd ever lost a penny. He just was a man who was filled with joy every day. And evidently, he went through that crisis. I'm sure there were some difficult moments, but he never lost his faith and never lost that. Do you find yourself, do you know of people like that? Have you had relatives like that? You've also had the other kind, right? Are there people that no matter how good things are, they're going to be worse tomorrow? Have you ever worked among, uh, well, my first work was in a mining community. And my mother kind of shook her head and said, oh, what you're getting yourself into. It is difficult whenever they were union workers who were expecting a strike every year. 
And so it was very difficult as far as they were concerned to plan any future for the Lord's church because we never knew when their, the, the union negotiations were going to break down or there was going to be a layoff and everything was going to go wrong. And besides, many of them were working the second and third shifts and that's hard on your psychological makeup and joy in your life anyway to be off that natural cycle. And that was frustrating. But really, we've got a choice. Are we going to rejoice or not? This is a book of full joy. There is no dodging of reality in this book. Paul's going to talk about false teachers. Paul's going to talk about suffering. Paul's going to talk about going to heaven or staying on earth. Paul's even going to talk about the elephant in the room back then. We don't want to talk about elephants in the room, do we? That's why we, that's why we call them an elephant in the room. They should be obvious but nobody wants to talk about Yodia and Syntyche who can't get along. But Paul's going to address that. There's no dodging of reality in this joy. Paul's consequent, the consequences for Paul having an unsuccessful hearing before Caesar, he's an individual now who's become an absolute ruler of the right of life and death over anyone he chooses. His rights have given him a, a chance to talk to Caesar but he will virtually have no rights before Caesar. Epaphroditus nearly died. He tells us all about false teachers. Two sisters in the church aren't getting along, but through it all, Paul is rejoicing, continues to rejoice, and commands rejoicing. Can you think of anything why? Maybe it's because he's able to conclude the letter saying, the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household, chapter 4, verse 22. There's new saints, and that's always a chance to rejoice. Next, Greek, next week, we'll talk about that command. Rejoicing is not optional. It is a choice, but it's not. If we're going to obey God, it's not. We must do it, absolutely. Remember, that does not mean every moment of our lives is going to be happy with a great big grin on our face. And while I have been accused of being little Miss Mary Sunshine who wakes up with a smile on her face every single day, I thought it was a nice compliment, honestly. Yet, sometimes we go to bed and things aren't so great. Because as the psalmist said, Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing, but rejoicing comes in the morning. There'll be joy in the morning. One of these mornings, for sure. Remember that song? How about another verse? In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory. In the morning of joy, oh, the bliss of that morn when our loved ones we meet with the songs of the ransom we each other shall greet. Singing praise to the Lamb through eternity's years. With the past all forgotten, with its sorrows and tears. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. That was my mother's uh, retaliation to my father. He would sing at the top of his lungs on a long car trip, um, How Great Thou Art, to the point of annoyance, and she would retaliate with In the Morning of Joy. What a wonderful trip it was. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm glad, glad to have you.